Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to this episode of the ESG and Tech Show. My name is Susan Hayes Cullerton, and I'm delighted to be with you here today to talk to you about a very different sort of a topic. And I often find when I start the show, I say that every time. And that is because this show really does give us an opportunity to combine two aspects of what's happening today. One is in the whole world of investing. What's new? What's up and coming? What's the market doing? What are different stocks doing? What are different ETFs doing? But also what's happening in the world and that is really current. So that's why over this show we've talked about public transport and the future of it. We've talked about 3D printing. We've talked about a range of different things. But today we're going to talk about a very important topic and that is the topic of the S of ESG. Today, we're going to talk about the environmental, social and governance aspects of looking at stocks, but particularly the S of ESG. That is really what I wanted to talk to you about today. And also, we're going to have a chat about the rising importance of it for a start, but also how are we doing as an investment community in supporting the S? Because I think myself, and we'll see whether you agree with me, we've put a lot more focus on the E of ESG. So today I want to focus on the S and certainly I think this is one of the characteristics of 2022 in investing is looking at the S instead. So today in today's episode I'm going to talk you through what ESG is, why S is of rising importance and I'm also going to talk about the contrast in between E and S, how sometimes they don't agree. Is that if you were to pursue an E of the ESG agenda, which again is environmental, social and governance, if you were to pursue E how you might be doing that at the expense of S and likewise. I'm going to give you some resources as well that I'm going to walk through and show you so that you then can get a sense of the conversation and go and check it out yourself. And then also, of course, precisely what we're going to do then is jump straight in and take a look at how we might be able to invest accordingly and not just to support uh, an S agenda or an ESG agenda, but how we can do so with an investing agenda as well from the point of view of timing and analyzing the investment opportunities that are on offer. So that is what our uh, session today is going to look like. But before we do that, I'm going to start the way I always do. And that is to ask you to tell us there in the chat, where are you tuning in from? So please do pop on over there, in, over to the chat and let us know what part of the world you are tuning in from. And let us know what part of the world. And that is me just making sure there that I've got everything up and running. So let us know exactly now what I was just doing there is just checking. Okay, great stuff. Just checking to see that I could hear exactly where people are joining us from. And it's appearing there now on my screen. Great stuff. All right. So we are currently, we have Danny who is joining us from Antwerp. Uh, we have Robert who's joining us from Florida. Uh, James. Who's joining us from Puerto Rico? Ah, Maria, hello. Joining us from Maine. You're very welcome back. And uh, Lauren, who's joining us from the Philippines. You know, I think this is the first time I've had somebody from the Philippines tell me they were joining us from the Philippines. Um, I can see here we have got Maria who's joining us from New York City, Alfonso in Birmingham, Raymond in Florida, 
uh, Ramon in Colorado, Daniel in Missouri. Okay, keep them coming. I can see there that we've loads and loads of people who have joined us. So it is, uh, it's wonderful to hear where you're all joining us from. Uh, Jot Beats is joining us from North Carolina. James is joining us from Georgia. Roswell in, jo in Georgia. Great stuff. Keep them coming. South Dakota, Casey is joining us from. Uh, Fred is joining us from Kingston, Ontario. Uh, as I say, keep them coming. We're only delighted to hear where you are joining us from. And also, I will tell you that a couple of weeks ago, I was a guest on Stan's International User Group. And we had people, it was on Saturday, we had people from all over the world again joining us from all over the place. And he said that day, it was one of the chattiest chats. Uh, but I, I think now I might have, when you put an Irish woman in front of an audience around the world, and she knows she can talk to people and hear back from them. You know, you're on to something there. Uh, let me see there, what's that name? Nirmal is joining us from Toronto. Okay, quite the uh, Canadian contingent today. Okay, brilliant. So what I'm gonna do now is, as I say, I'm gonna start off. Um, hello, uh, Forward Inc is joining us from Maryland. I'm gonna start off today by talking to you a little bit about ESG. And oh, can I first of all ask, before I get into this, how many of you consider ESG when you're investing? Now, and let me just clarify exactly what I mean by that. In some cases, that might mean I look at ESG first and then use that to refine my set of opportunities. Or you might alternatively look at your set of opportunities and then, then look at ESG secondarily afterward. So can I just hear that for a start? How many of you actually use ESG in your decision making at all? You just let me, there, let me know there in the chat. If you do, tell me why you do or what you do. And then, of course, on the other hand, if you don't, tell me why you don't. Is it because you haven't thought about it? Is it because it isn't high in your agenda, etc. And thank you indeed, Daniel says, please, everybody, like and share. Yes, indeed, please do like and share. So Maria says she does. Okay, uh, please do keep, keep our conversation going there. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to pop on over here. And I am going to show you my first uh my first screen here which is what exactly is esg so e the question to ask is how does a company benefit or harm the environment s question is how does a company interact with its employees and broader community and g for governance is how does the company align stakeholder interests drive sustained business growth and like I say, today, we're going to focus in here on the S. So in your case, when you look at stocks, when you look at decisions that you're making around stocks or ETFs or investments, what is it that you do? Uh, what is it that, that you look for? David here is joining us also from Rhode Island. Marie, uh, Maria says not yet, but intend to. Chris is joining us from Canada. Jame, uh, Jame is joining us, or has said not yet. Okay. So I want to give you a range of ways of doing these. I want to show you how to do both. I want to show you how to simply look for ESG investments and then make up your mind, which I'm going to analyze for you. And then I'm also going to turn that those tables. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you how to look at an investment that you may be interested in and then analyze its ESG relationship. Okay. And again, particularly, I'm going to look at the S today. All right. So this is particularly what, what the, the S refers to as how does a company interact with its employees and broader community. Now, I always find it interesting to look backwards first before we look forwards, or indeed even before we look, we look currently. Because if any of you went and had a look at the J&J, &J, the Johnson & Johnson credo, let's just take a look here at the Johnson & Johnson credo. Okay? And just look here at what this says. Now, this credo, this um this this company document that they decided to commit to is if i'm right over 100 years uh 1902 okay and let me just show you what it sh it says right so we believe that the first responsibility etc now look here though is look here at this look at it here at this bit we are responsibility to the communities in which we live and work in the world community as well we must help people to be healthier by supporting better access and care in more places around the world we must be good citizens, support good works and charities, better health and education, and bear our fair share of taxes. We must maintain in good order property we are privileged to use, protecting the environment and natural resources. This is over 100 years old. 
And then also, when you look here at the, the line above, that is, we are responsible to our employees who work with us and throughout the world. We respect their diversity, dignity. And and on it goes. You can you can read it there. I'm sure you've, you've come across the Johnson & Johnson credo. The first place I discovered it, actually, was nothing to do with the company or nothing to do with investment. I read the book Good to Great. Some of you might be familiar with that book. And they referenced the credo in there. So how do you go from being a good company to a great company? We talk about the importance of having something like this there. So, as I say, S refers to how does a company interact with its employees and the broader community. The Johnson & Johnson credo was for one particular company. And back then, of course, there was no acronym, which was ESG. And also, there wasn't any focus either on measuring it. Whereas today, as I mentioned, there absolutely are, or there, there absolutely is. Let me just briefly show you the types of companies that we're going to talk about today. I'm going to take you through three particular ETFs here. Uh, one is the SHE ETF. This one is going to focus on, on gender diversity. Uh, then I'm going to show you an ESG ETF more broadly. I'm going to show you an ESGU ETF in the US. Again, an, another broad based one. I'm also just going to show you a uh, this one, which is a specifically a, a, a diversity ETF here. This one is based in London. And then I'm also going to show you one that is up and coming that is a little bit, no, not a little bit, much lesser known. Uh, I want to show you that as well, just to show you there what's, what's coming on the radar as we go along. So I'm going to show you all of those during our conversation today. Now, let me take a look there at the chat and let me see what you have been saying. Oh, first of all, now that is not what I had intended to do. Okay, so what I just want to check in here now is just to see what you've been saying. Okay, Lauren says, I rely mostly on a technical analysis of ETFs. I'll take a look at ESG ETFs after this. That's great to hear, Lauren, and I'm going to do that with you today. So stay tuned and settle in. I'm going to do exactly the same. Daniel says, I think it's a factor for my swing trades. Uh, example being CROX, VV rated by and in the forefront of environmental things like recycling, plastics for their crocs, etc. I got burned years ago when the lumber liquidator story broke in 60 minutes about for, oh yeah, formaldehyde in the flooring. They never really recovered. And I know those examples are more specifics and not a broad rating. All the same though, relevant, relevant nonetheless. Well, can I get you, can I, can I just get to a sticky point, right? Because I think we need to discuss this. And we need to make sure that we deal with this before we actually get in and, and let look at the actual stocks involved. When do E and S disagree? Because you might think, OK, well, if a company is doing well environmentally, the likelihood, the likelihood is, is that it's also doing well on a on a social basis. How it's interacting with the environment and how it's interacting socially are two maybe very different things. Now different but aligned what happens when they disagree so can i give you a simple example simple imagine that we have a company who is producing oil or fossil fuels okay so i'm sure you're all thinking okay that's bad e but if that shuts down then of course jobs are lost assets are, are either wasted not invested anymore no longer in use and the consequences of both of course then have knock-on effects on supply chains on um, extended labor or secondary labor the taxes collected in that country etc so sometimes e and s actually disagree this is the challenge now what i'll also say is based on what i've what i've been seeing but in my research i can see that there's been far more focus on e than s and let me just give you one measure of that is because in Europe, in the EU, we now have a taxonomy focusing on environmental impact. So companies now can actually categorize where they are on the taxonomy in terms of environmental impact. We're not seeing that with this. We're not seeing that yet at all. There's far less measurement going into it. So as a result, of course, then that means that sometimes we don't know how much they disagree or we can't measure one over the other. And that's why I wanted particularly to draw your attention to it today. So, let me just show you one piece. I just want to show you one article about this. And let me hop on over there to that. 
Okay, and that is the elephant in the room. It's called the elephant in the room, the ESG confliction. This is produced by the CFA Institute. And as you can see here, it says, fund managers are traditionally judged on performance. However, their ability to incorporate ESG factors is another area of competitive pressure. How do they maintain performance while also meeting expectations around ESG? So um, let me just pop down here. Investing in large ESG positive businesses also has a destructive effect. It channels money away from the asset heavy job creating industries that support local communities. But what about small and medium enterprises that score low on ESG and need to finance their net zero transition? Is the market punishing or helping them? And so let's think about both of those. Who are they talking about when they talk about the asset heavy job creating industries? Well, a lot of non environmental sectors, anything to do with fossil fuels, anything to do with large consumption of energy. And the particularly like we're looking at aviation, uh, we're looking at shipping, but particularly clothing. Clothing has a huge environmental impact. So all, and of course, each of those three areas that I've just mentioned would be asset heavy and job creating. And secondly, I would definitely say when it looks to SMEs, and of course today's SME could be tomorrow's IPO. The thing is that what happens there is that our small businesses making a net zero transition, if not, why not? I would say to a large degree, it's because they're already probably very busy and trying to manage to make a profit, et cetera, and may not have certainly the time and the headspace of the people in order to handle that as well. So when you put all of that together, of course, there is this conversation. Now, that's not to say we shouldn't consider it though. We're absolutely sure that's not to say we shouldn't consider it, but I do think it is worthwhile raising as well. So just down here, I'm just gonna bring, bring the, last, uh, the last bit. Earlier on in this article, they talk about Asia giving a lot of profits out in dividends, just culturally, just to set that precursor. So, um, sustainability is no longer a nice to have accessory. It's a, it's a way to future proof their business, but delivering on E is expensive. If the cost cannot be passed on to the customer, it has to come out of the business, whether it's staff salaries, bonuses, or headcount. And it may render certain functions and jobs obsolete. E comes at the expense of S. So in Asia, the objective used to be squeezing the last drop of profit out of the business. Now it's shifting to longevity and legacy. Paying out all profits and dividends is short-sighted while playing the long game may increase margins, another word for that is profits, over time. And to accomplish this, companies need the right investors. So like I say, similarly, it is important that we bear this in mind, that we have this uh, consideration and that E and S is more complicated, particularly the interaction between them than, may, than it may seem. All the same, that means, I still think that still means that we should continue to have the conversation and figure out how this works. Now, can I, uh, let me first of all have a look here. Maria says, I like Crocs, it's good to know Dave. And uh, then Maria says, yes, they're a fantastic underrated company in my opinion. Okay, let's analyze them. Let's analyze them as well. Right, so now what I'm gonna do is, can I just conduct a quick experiment over here? I'm just gonna bring you over here to the Lixer ETF page, right? So it's, it's uh, Lixer is, one of the ETF providers in the world. One of the biggest, the three biggest are iShares, State Street, and Vanguard. They're the three biggest ETF providers in the world. Now, when I looked at this in, in my preparation for today, I could see here, right? I clicked here on ESG and there was 53 ETFs. Yeah, okay, we can see, see that pretty clear. But if you scroll down through them, you can see here, the vast majority of them are focused on climate, world climate transition, um, they're all emerging markets, new energy. Uh, I'll talk about the, these types of ETF shortly. Net zero, water, SRI is socially responsible investing. Net zero, um, if I keep going there, green bond, um, future mobility, robotics and AI. Keep going, world climate, green bond again, net zero, smart cities. And it's only when you get down here that actually you find one that's just focused on the S. And this is what I find intriguing. And this is why I am coming back to the point I'm making that this area is worthwhile considering because few enough people are talking about it. And yet when I was looking at one of the trends that um, 
I spoke about in last year's December episode, which was the, the key trends that were I felt were going to be shaping 2022. One of them was this one, that I felt it was the year for the S of ESG to really make its mark. So this is why I wanted to make sure and have this conversation properly. All right. So now that we have talked about what is the S of ESG, now that we've talked about the contradictions that can be in between the two, now what I'm going to do is pop on in there. Let's take a look at the program and let's look at some stocks that are that are, that are actually uh, out there at the moment. Okay, I'm going to start off here with this one. Okay, this one trades in the UK. I know you might say, hang on a second now. What do you mean it does? No, it trades, it trades in the UK. So it's the iShares uh, Refinitiv Inclusion and Diversity Usage ETF. Okay, so here, so far, it's down 17.85%. And I want to discuss that. Its expense ratio is 0.25, which actually is, is higher than any of the like really big broad ones like the FTSE 100, but it's lower than some of the more customized ones as well. So what does it do? Well, it com finds competitively priced, it is competitively priced and diversified access to companies that demonstrate high levels of diversity, inclusion, and people development and low news controversy. So the idea here is that you invest in next generation companies across developed and emerging markets that have the potential to foster innovative environments leading to long-term growth. And there is also a use to diversify a global equity portfolio and gain exposure to long-term potential growth trend. So that is what it is designed to do. In essence, this is focusing on diversity, but also it is a global equity portfolio as well. And it seeks to track the performance of around about 100 companies. So let's just take a look here and see how uh, it is doing. I'm going to do annualized. So in the past year, it's down 16%. Over the past three years, it's been up 4% per year. Okay, if we look at cumulative, um, you can see, yeah, since inception, is 15.85%. All right, look, one way or the other, we can see that this year has not been good. Previous years have been, uh, except for year 20, it looks like, Beginning, oh yeah, was, that was COVID. Sorry, sorry, that was the COVID, the COVID drop. All right. Now, let me just pop on down here and I can see a range of different things that are all very interesting, but I just want to get to the point. And the point is that we've got 94 holdings and particularly when we look at the sustainability characteristics of this, as you can imagine, they're very high. AAA rating when it comes to ESG. Quality score is 9.75 out of 10. Um, across the board, it's all good, right? Now, that's all fine. The question is, what is it like to actually invest in? So I'm going to bring you to our, to our UK product. And what I'm going to do is let me first of all look at the graph. Now, this is actually very hard to read because of whatever is going on there. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to shift it. Now, much better, much better. Okay. So when we take a look at this stock, there's one thing in particular stands out to me. That is the RT. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to change the style of this to where it's a red line and it's thicker. <coughs> no, much happier with that. Now, let's take a look at this company. What do we see going on here? Well, let me just expand it out. So we've got the full, we've got the full line up here. So it's since, um, since Vectorvest has been analyzing this, you can see here that Back here in 2021, it was basically up and down, up and down, up and down. And then since then, it has been in decline. Now, why I am interested in showing you this one is because when I looked into this company, this ETF, sorry, I just thought to myself, OK, this makes a lot of sense in order to find companies that are embracing diversity, because we know that diversity and inclusion leads to better business practices. But from an investing point of view, would it be worth it? Because if you look at it, it only had a buy rating back here, which was true and accurate. It had a buy rating in here, just as it was peaking, a buy rating here and a buy rating here. So where are we at now? Well, I think if you scroll right in, you can see here that it's had quite a significant drop. So I'll tell you what I like about it, and I'll tell you what I would, why I would be concerned about. What I like about it is look at the RT at the moment. The RT looks to me like the buyers are starting to win against the sellers that's what's happening so here on the 23rd of september back then 
we had there was very little liquidity which is what i don't like and i'll explain that but from then on we can see that even though the price has been falling or static that the rt has been rising and what that's telling me is we have got a divergence we've got a bullish divergence we can see that while the stock is falling the momentum in here is rising and that's what i like about this stock this is something that i'm i'm interested in oh sorry hang on a second why is that saying five those why might that be is that what it is at the moment oh sorry that is what it is at the moment apologies you know what it is is of course that i've scrolled right in i've scrolled right in and that is because then when there was these other these other little things that were going on here that I, i'm not quite sure here what's what's going on there but anyway so what we can see there is that actually the stock price did indeed rise and as you can see it's broken up over one dropped back down again and now broken up over one again i'm just going to try and zoom in here again a little bit yeah okay no that's that's not today so we can see here that actually the momentum is on our side when it comes to this this stock and right now we're just at an rt of one so this is one this is one of those diversity stocks where when we take a look at it from a technical point of view the, the bearish divergence there or the bullish divergence that we were seeing there which was that the momentum i could see was heading up while the price is coming down that was an example certainly of where i could see okay this one has has some potential now that said can i point out something because this is the bit that i don't like i am going to go in here and look at the volume because when i look at the volume of this stock at the moment tuesday the 18th of october it was 22.997 um i have a company at the moment that i've had for years and it's 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 risen in price which is great but i want to sell it and i've had a market order open for a while the problem is is that i can't seem to sell it because there isn't any buyers for that stock now the stock is is listed at a certain price and it's a good company and it's risen in price but actually i had to ring my stockbroker earlier on that we can say will you please help me out here with this because i can't i can't sell this on my own and you would not want to be doing that with too many stocks so that's the one issue that i'd have here is that our volume at the moment there is twenty two thousand, and there's some days there it's one there's other days it's forty thousand. some days yeah there's been very very little liquidity of it so do i see potential here from a technical point of view i do from the idea of what the etf is actually comprised of i do my concern would certainly be the volume in the chart. okay and this of course is traded in pounds uh so therefore or this of course is is trading in yeah in pounds so you would be having exposure to the uk currency namely the sterling here as well should you should you look at a company like that okay now let me just move on to another list of stocks that i came up with from a gender point of view right so this is broadly speaking gender wise this is what i came across right the, these were all in europe so over here first one up here was the iShares Refinitiv Inclusion and Diversity which I showed you already and then down here we have Lixer Global Gender Identity as well uh, sorry Lixer Global Gender Equality and uh, this ETF then is focusing on achieving gender equality as a path to the well-being of families and communities while strengthening productivity etc now I looked and I looked and I looked for L I looked for it everywhere L ETF looked all over the place for it and when i went in here to click on it it keeps on looping me back to let you see private investor yes indeed i am looping me back to the beginning so i do not know why that might be the case so instead i'm moving over here and i'm oh actually here we are <laughs> here i have it now okay i have it now i'll tell you where i actually did did find it when i went searching for here down here was where but it's just this one is g-e-n-d so I'm wondering if something going on there if that is the 
Yeah. Okay. Well, anyway, right there we go. The reason is that I've I've been I've been a, a fan of L for for quite a while, and also as you can see, the performance this year has outperformed most of the stock markets around the world. So if I was to look at the performance year to date, let's just say, of I'm going to take the just just to be fast about it, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to change these stocks. Change these stocks to October. I'm going to change these over here to the 3rd of January. And OK. Now, let me just quick test all of these just, just briefly. OK. Here you can see the S&P 500 is down minus 22%. L, on the other hand, is down 8. 8.57%. TER, total expense ratio of 0.2%. Um, then you can also see the assets under management, currently 43 million sterling. Uh, the Eisen is over here. Um, the dividend policy is, is capitalization. Is that if you were to look at the uh, ETF versus the benchmark index, it's, you know, it's, it's okay. It's, it's um, sorry, it's much better than okay. I was just about to say something else. We can see here that the, the, um, the tracking error is very, very tight. And of course, the Total expense ratio is very, very low. So we can see that's that's happening there as well. Over the past three years, annualized rate of return has been 5%. Um, if you look at the calendar performances, 17% uh, in 2021, 7% in 2020, 21% in 2019. And as you can see here, very, very tight delivery. So this is one where the ESG, if you look at the holdings, a lot of them actually may not necessarily be well, overly familiar with. So Eli Lilly, I'm sure a lot of you will know that. Uh, I, now, I hope I'm saying this correctly, but it's Cayaxa Bank. And that's a Spanish, that's like a Spanish, a set of like almost like credit unions. Uh, Hershey, Bristol Myers Squibb, Merck, Abvi, etc. So this is, this particular ETF is solely intended uh, to track the Selective Equally Global Gender Equality Net Total Return Index. And it's an equally weighted benchmark of 150 companies around the world that score highly for gender equality, according to the 19 criteria. Companies involved in weapons, gambling and tobacco and those in the Norwegian Ethics Council list are excluded. And they're efficient, they are efficient investment vehicles listed on an exchange that offer transparent, liquid and low cost exposure to the underlying benchmark. So in this case, as you can see, it has outperformed. Now, yes, of course, it is negative performance this year. But look, a lot of them are at the moment, but that certainly is one that I have been watching. I've been watching L for a while. And so I think that that one is certainly um, worth another, uh, worth adding or adding to, to a watch list to be able to consider if that is, is one for you. So then we have the other one here, which is the Global Equality uh, Use of CTF. That's another one that that's in there as well. So there's, I'm not going to go through the last one. I just want to talk, talk you through, to give you an example of the first two here, of which I've shown you the Refinitiv Inclusion and L. Both of those give a different type of exposure to the S of ESG. So John says, what is the ticker? The ticker is L, E-L-L-E. -L -E. There it is. The ticker over here is E-L-L-E. -L -E. And also uh, this one is, I am correct, trading in sterling. Trading in index currencies dollars, but domicile is Luxembourg. Because the domicile is in Luxembourg, that's what's throwing me. And as I mentioned, the assets, the assets under management there are forty one. 43.1 million. So, you know, quite, quite a small company um, or quite a small ETF for the moment in terms of assets under management. I've looked at this before. I've looked at L before. Uh, and I think I, it was one of my ESG and tech episodes where I just solely focused on, no, it was, it was a previous episode than that again, uh, where I solely focused on does gender diversity actually lead to better share prices in the bottom line? And I researched it theoretically and then I researched practically here with you all. So as I say, I've been a fan of L for, for quite some time. Let me just pop on over here now and let me take a look at a couple of ETFs, uh, of other ETFs that I just want to point out different things that they've been doing. So the first one I want to point out to you here is She. 
Okay, so she is the US version of L, and that is the she ETF again focuses on diversity, uh, female led businesses, etc. So if I just briefly, it's State Street, have that one because I haven't shown you one yet. She, yeah, GGS, uh, State Street, yeah, okay. And I'm going to show you this one much bigger, much bigger altogether. Um, you're dealing with 199 million under uh, assets under management. Similarly, again, 0.2% of a total expense ratio. And you can see here over the next uh, three to five years, we have uh, the earnings per share expected growth is about 12.33%. It is also more diverse. It's got 202 holdings as opposed to the number that I showed you in the last one. The PE ratio is at 16.6 .6 as well. And also, if I was just to pop on down here, you can see the yield as well is at 1.61%. Now, question is, how are we doing? So you can see here, so far year to date, it is down more. Oh, here we go. Here we go. Okay, here we go. So when it comes to the market value here in the year to date, it, it has had a real, it really has been affected quite a lot. In the past uh, five years, it's been 4.3%. Because of course, obviously, with the big the big impact of what's happened, in, it's lost a quarter of its value in the past year. But also, since inception, it's delivered six point eight four percent. Given that in 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 consideration, now, given that some of you I know are contrarian investors, I would like to put forward this idea, and let's take a look at this graph as well. Let me take a look here. I'm going to graph. Well, I graph them all, but let me just take a look, particularly at B. I always think of, you know, the, the song, she, she, the beauty, she, you know that song. Anyway, so when I look at this, I want to take off all of these things now. And there is two I want to leave on. One is the moving average, but the other one that I want to offer up is RT. Because I'm interested to see how this has been going as well. Now, this has very, this ETF has very rarely had a buy recommendation. However, look at what has been going on over here is that you can see that the she etf has dropped from 110 dollars in fact to maybe more yeah so its highest point no no data exists before 12th of march 20 40 day month yeah. okay so the price here it peaked at 107 and ever since then as you can see that it has it has fallen quite significantly down there as far as 78 the reason that i wanted to put this forward is yet again look at what i look at what i'm seeing is that we see a divergence right here here i can see let me just draw a line for you we can see here there is an upper trend in that momentum and i will right click go to style i will make that more solid press ok and let me add in another one Add in another line here i can also see that we have got an underlying trend from where the bottom of the momentum really seemed to happen back here in the middle of the summer let me similarly right click style okay so as you can see here again we can see that there is um some upward upward momentum also let's look at the top here we can also see the same let me right click here okay so we can see also here you can see first of all you can see that the momentum is we can see it there on the tops but also we're seeing the the there is more steep at the top too now as a result of that i am looking at momentum coming from the buyers as distinct to the sellers that is what is of interest to me Still, I wouldn't be buying this until one of two things happened, and ideally both, is that I would want to see this going above one. And the RT at the moment is at 0.97, so it is pretty close. But I would want to see this going above one. I'd want to see it cutting above one. And or I would also like to see price going above the 40-day moving average. Because look at what happened here when it went above the 40-day moving average. It went up, it went right up there and it fell back down again. Now, if you'd bought here and sold here, you would have done well. As another alternative, if you bought here and sold here, you would have probably netted out pretty, you know, pretty equally. 
if you bought here and sold here, you would have been um, out after after a little bit. You would have made, you know, a slight, slight profit. Let me just go back here further. Okay, if you'd bought here and sold here, then again, that would have been a significant profit. So for all those reasons, what I'd like to see is I would like to see the RT going above one and I'd like to see the price going above the, the 40 day moving average. They are the two things that I would like to see. But this really has has been it's been it's been really pushed down. But the focus on these companies and the nature of the work that they're doing internally, they, in my opinion, anyway, uh, offer some interesting possibilities. So that is the she ETF there that I wanted to talk you through and also to explain about that bearish bullish divergence and the 40 day moving average over there as well. OK, right now, just want to bring you then through these two. These two are two broad based ESG ETFs. OK, so so much broader, but both of them. If I can just on here now to today. Let me bring you back to today. Back to reality. OK, bring you over here today, 19th of October. And OK, right. So now what you can see here is that we've got three hold recommendations. And over here, we can see that the, uh, the VST are the numbers that they are. But we have three very different RTs. She is the top one. It's above, it's above one, or it is above 0.95. It's close, close, it's the closest to one of the others. But then, as you can see here, there are two other, there are two other ones here. We've got Flex, Flex Shares ESG, and we've iShares MSCI USA. So let's just take a look at both of these. Right, so pretty similar story in that it suffered a really significant loss, and also we can see that the RT is rising. Now it's up; it's not up as high as she is, but we're certainly in that same scenario. And over here, then we have kind of some something similar. But of course, what we might be wondering is like, how does that actually perform relative to some of the other companies that we've been watching this year? So let's just take a look over here and. Right, so let's move over here to performance. Right. Now I'm going to ES, I'm going to take remove this. So we've ESGU. I want to add in here she. I want to add in here spy. I want to add in here um Salesforce. I want to add in here um, yeah. <laughs> thanks Maria. Maria likes back to reality. I want to add in here. What else do I want to add in? What else do I want to add in? I want to give you a tech stock. I want to give you some ESG ETFs. I want to give you the market and let me get a farmer for you. No, let, let me get Netflix, for example, and I'm going to get a pharma. I'm going to get a PS. Now, all right. So if we were to take a look at right now, we can see that actually phar the pharma would have performed the, the best PFE, namely Pfizer. Then <clears throat> the next one would be the market. So the market, the market over the past year, like actual calendar year, would have been mixed up. Right, so that, that's been down, <clears throat> excuse me, around about, what's that, 20-ish, yeah, percent. Then the next one would have been ESGU, right, that would have been the next one down. Then after that, we would look at she, which was down 28%. Then we would say um, uh, Salesforce was down 46%, and then we have Netflix down 56%. So if we were to look over that period of time, it's quite clear that our pharmaceutical is going is going to be performing the best there because number one it's defensive we all know obviously what's happened over the last couple of years as regards pfizer and we know that the year that the tech stocks have had okay what about if we were to move back in time and what about if we were to go back to the pandemic and now let's see okay so now netflix would have been the best performer if we had if we were selling everything last summer Netflix would have been our best performer. The next one down after that was ESGU again. The next one down after that was the S&P 500 and Salesforce actually moved in lockstep throughout the, the pandemic. And then the next one from there was 
Pfizer, which did well in, you know, as soon as we actually had a vaccine. And then the one after that then was she. So actually she, the she ETF and Pfizer moved together. But let's now just extend and let's take a look on a three year view. Where are we at now? Because this is the thing about like who exactly is, is lasting the pace here is when we look at this, this company here, like when we look at, I think that's Netflix, is it? That might just change because we have she and Netflix here. Let me just change the style. I'm going to change that style to uh, blue. Okay. okay. When you look at Netflix, Netflix was the one that went through the most volatile growth. Now, if I go back there to 2018, Netflix at the time was at a totally different level, right? Totally and utterly different level. And as you can see here, Netflix over that period of time, over that entire period of time is up 40%, despite the fact that it was up as high as 261%. So that's gone through absolutely massive meteoric, both earnings and PE ratio change. When we look at the sales force, it's pretty much done the same thing. I, I focused the last in the last ESG and tech episode. I looked at sales force from the point of view of looking at cloud collaboration. The company doubled its revenue in three years, and yet the share price has, hasn't actually moved. If you look at the last three direct years, so uh, 2019 to 2022. Then after that, then we would have uh, ESGU and the S&P 500. So ESGU actually outperformed over that period of time. Because ESGU, that's the ETF focusing on ESG stocks versus the, the market itself directly, that they've actually pretty much moved in lockstep, but ESGU did slightly better. And she was the ETF that was down. That is why I think that we've got a contrarian opportunity with the she ETF as long as you take a look at the RT and the, the 40 day moving average. I think there's that's where I see the opportunity being. And also, if I just close that, if I go back to, I'm just going to add a new graph here. I'm just going to see again. I, one thing I do want to check, and that is the same thing that I checked the last time in the last stock, and that is volume. What you're going to see here is, in many ways, more consistent volume in the SHE ETF. It's more more consistent. So here you can see 4,000, 29,000. It's just not zero, not one. 42 not three and a half thousand tends to be more um more more consistent so that is one but again this is what i'd be watching i wouldn't be going anywhere unless i'm seeing the stock rise over over the, those two metrics now what i now want to do in the last couple of minutes that i have is that i also want to show you if you have an etf that you're looking for and you want to look at back like if you want to look at it from the point of view of the how ESG friendly is it? Let me take, take a look at that, at that for you. Let me go to iShares. I'm going to go to iShares. This time, I'm going to look at a completely non-ESG ETF, right? I'm just going to find a market. I'll pop on in here into Europe and I go in here to, to UK, despite the fact I'm based in Ireland. Let me go in there anyway. I'm going to accept individual investor and I am going to view all iShares products. Now, I'm just going to find anything, right? Any, yeah, world ETF, right? Here we go. Here's a world ETF. It's hedged and it's down 20% and it's six pounds, right? Fair enough. Here is what I do is that I scroll down, scroll down, scroll down to the sustainability card. That's what I do. That is how you find it is that all the ETFs now typically have the sustainability characteristics. And this... And it brings me back to that article that I started off with there with the elephant in the room is yes indeed E might come at the expense of S and likewise but in many ways what might surprise you is how much the existing profitability of a company is linked to that so as a result a lot of these companies can actually do pretty well when it comes to having a AAA rating or an ESG quality score or the, the coverage, well, the coverage that it has just means the companies that it's, that it's actually analyzing. But that's how you can do it, is you can go through iShares or whatever ETF website that you're looking for and look at it through that lens. So just wanted to mention that as well. 
I am, as I say, coming to the last couple of minutes of this of this episode. So if anybody does have any questions, please do pop them into the chat. I am keeping an eye right over there on you. So please do pop them in there if you would like to know. Now, before I finish, I do also want to bring this piece to you. And this it comes from the Rockefeller Foundation. And what this is, is the NACCP. Okay, so this ETF focuses on race diversity as distinct to gender or as distinct to broad ESG. So this, this ETF has allowed us to engage corporations in discussions. What is your commitment to a diverse board to supplier diversity and so on? With corporations that have funded us historically, the ETF has allowed us to step back and say, we thank you for your support. The, okay, and so on from there. So if we article. Apparently it's my choice. I'm trying to choose. Oh. And so this is the ETF here. It is NACP. So this is the um, Minority Empowerment ETF. NACP. Look at it. So this ETF is here. Okay. 1.3 million shares outstanding. Dividend of nine cents. The dividend yield is at 1.27%. Yeah, Maria. I'm, okay, I'm just going to uh, just going to answer the questions here that, that are coming in. So in this case here, and the net expense ratio is higher. Now, like I say, a lot of these do actually, um, a lot of these ETFs that have more of an ESG focus tend to have ratios that are higher. So 0.49% is on the higher side, wouldn't be on the highest. But certainly is coming at a at a higher pace, all right, to be sure. And let me pop on down here. So Maria mentions most holdings in these F, in these ETFs are tech companies like Apple, Microsoft, Tesla, Google. And that's why, of course, a lot of these are being hit at the moment. Which again reinforces the point is that if you are looking for people are always asking me, oh, should I get into the tech sector now? Because it's really been beaten down. I would say, look, don't just get into something because it's beaten down have your decision about when you're going to look at something like this so in this case you can see here apple amazon microsoft nvidia alphabet meta johnson johnson a lot of these companies of course have been absolutely beaten down and sure and our, our the tech sector is not very loved this year in the stock market for sure but if you're deciding to get back in well then you could do so with a diversity lens or a gender direct lens or an esg lens and then use your technical analysis to build up upon that and then take it from there. So John says, please show your email for a longer question. John, if you send it into support at vectorvest.com, it will find me. And is there anything else here that I need to show all? I think it is everything. So on that note, let me know. Go back to where I started, which is here. And just to let's bring our conversation out to a close. And again, please do, as I say, keep keep any questions coming in there. What I wanted to talk to you about today is to talk to you about what S is. What is S when it comes to ESG? And then from there, build out accordingly and then say, right, where does E and S, where do they contradict each other? Where do they, where do they not agree? And how does one lead to prevention of the other and I think that it's an important aspect of the conversation because at the end of the day businesses which of course every stock is businesses have to make resourcing decisions investors have to make decisions about where they're going to put their own respective resources who is going to win that race or how do businesses business models companies governments etc work together to align them from there then looking at various different opportunities that we see this year. Now, I, I completely find that when I'm talking about technology stocks, and I have often done that when it comes to my blockchain episode, when it came to the 3D printing one, the cloud collaboration one, is that many of the stocks, the tech stocks that we're looking at at the moment, are really going south. Okay, now, what do we do about that? Do we keep away from them, potentially? Or do we look at these and think, when is a good opportunity to get back in? The point of today's episode is, well, what other lens can we go in apart from tech stocks that are doing badly? Well, as an example, it could be a diversity ETF, the she, the, the she ETF that I mentioned, uh, the broad-based broad ESG. Well, 
Or we can also simply look at this from the point of view solely of the diversity side of things, S of ESG, and then see who we come across. And as you saw there in Lixer, for example, in Europe, a lot of the companies were pharmas or healthcare companies in some, in some way. Specifically, when it comes to making decisions, certainly from my point of view, when I'm looking at these technically, I like to look at relative timing, and relative timing is a stock's ability. I'm sorry, <laughs> it's not. Relative timing looks at a stock's direction, magnitude, and the dynamics of the share price change. Therefore, as things are moving, it's analyzing which direction they're going, with how much force, and also whether there's an awful lot of volatility. All of that is factored all into the equation. And I wanted to show you some in the UK. I want to show you some in uh, the US. I want to show you some where Elixir are coming from as well. And I also want to show you one that is up and coming. So on that note, we are just about to come up, coming up to time. I'm going to say thank you so much indeed to everybody who's joined me. Please do make sure and join our mailing list, sectorvest.com forward slash FFF three Fs so that uh, you can join our mailing list and you will then be notified when the next episode is coming. As always, Trending Thursdays is going to be taking place tomorrow with Len. So make sure that you check that out as well. And otherwise, I'm going to see you next month. Thank you so much, everyone. And until next time, thank you.